Welcome to Michael's Record Collection. I'm happy to have with me for this show, Carmine Apiece, legendary drummer. How you doing? Well, good boy. You got a record collection back there, huh? That's part of it, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I don't know how many of them that you're playing on, but I was looking at your discography today, and I wondered if you even know how many albums you've played on in your career. Nope. <laughs> Did you count them? No. I lost I count either. because... Um, you know, it's one thing to just find, you know, the Vanilla Fudge and the King Cobra and, the, you know, all of that stuff. But it's another thing completely to find all of the, you know, the the side work that you've done for other artists. It's yeah, just... Uh, I, used to, I used to list them on my website, but I think I lost track. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, so anyway, I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about this, uh, this new release that Cactus has out. This is a very special release because it's a live album from your, your first ever set. Yeah, unbelievable. It's like, uh, I don't even know where we got it, tell you the truth. My manager found it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I was doing an interview today and I was saying it must have been somebody snuck into the place with a, a bag with a, an old cassette player, maybe with a couple of mics, you know? Yeah. The, so uh, it doesn't the... sound that bad. We remastered it and it's, it totally captured the total energy. Yeah. Of, of the show which was unbelievable energy <laughs> i mean it was like i'm looking at him going man what was i 24 years old 22 years old at that point and 22 years old a fireball of drumming energy that yeah. I, I could not do today at 75. <laughs> you know? uh you know this is it's called the birth of cactus 1970 it was um released January 21st. It's just come out brand new on um, yep. Pyramid Cleopatra Records, and it's going to be CD, digital, and special purple vinyl. I know, which is crazy. I mean, vinyl on that. He, they didn't even do vinyl on my Energy Overload record that, you know, was came out a couple of months ago, and I thought that was an awesome record. Yeah, that's a good record. I, I, that's absolutely true. I, I got that one... Uh, I guess a few months ago, I guess, but uh, yeah, and we're we're already halfway through a new one. You are a busy, busy guy. I I got to well, tell you, you know why? <laughs> I have a studio in my house that makes it so easy. Yeah. You no, know? I mean, I I was telling my wife yesterday. I said, you know what? If I didn't have this studio, I would have probably lost my mind in COVID because. You know, all I had would would have been, uh, she had a house in Connecticut that had a big giant room that I had a set of drums in there. I can go up and play, but I couldn't play to anything. I couldn't record anything. All mm -hmm. I can do is play, play some solos and some grooves and stuff. But when we moved here to Florida and I put the studio together, I've done so much work here. It's unbelievable, you know? And all I do is walk through my garage into this little guest house we have and Everything's all set up. So the good thing is I don't have to change any any sound. I can record something on drums. And next week come in and go, you know what? I don't like that verse. I'm going to replace that verse. And I with the click, you know, and I mm -hmm. play to the click and I replace the verse. And it sounds exactly the same because the drums are not moved. The mics are not moved. Everything's exactly the same. The settings on the on the mic inputs and mic pre's, everything's the same. So it sounds exactly the same. You know how cool that is? Yeah, no, don't have to waste a whole lot of time setting up. It's already ready to go. Unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> like we did uh, that Vanilla Fudge song this year, uh, Stop in the Name of Love. Mm -hmm. And we recorded that in the studio in December 2019. The drums needed to be re-recorded. You know, and to re-record them, I would have had to get my drums in New York, <coughs> reset them all up, get the roadie to set them up, get a sound. And three or four hours later, I could start playing the track. Here, I got bass drums from 1971 that actually were on, might have been on that gig that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Right? And I got a slingle and snare drum from 2004. And these drums sound really great. Yeah. So when I got them here and set up for recording, they just sound great. You know, so yeah. 
So I am so happy we moved to Florida. I set this up because I kept busy. I did energy overload here. We're, we're, we're finishing a new King Cobra record. I produced a woman. I've done some tracks for, uh, speaking of other things I've done, I played on Arthur Brown's new version of Fire with uh, Brian Auger. Mm -hmm. It was cool. I did a Modern Drummer Festival in here, and I recorded Nico McBrain in here. You know, it's just amazing. I did some Christian songs I wrote. It's I would have went crazy. So anyway, yeah, Nick, Nico lives in Florida, too. Yeah, and Nico's yeah. a good friend. Nico's so, a good friend of mine. So you're over in Tampa, right? <clears throat> no, I'm in uh, outside West Palm. Oh, West Palm. Okay. You're on West Palm Beach. I, I got you confused with someone else. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. And I'm in Orlando, so we're not too far away. But yeah, Nick goes oh, down Pat south. Pat Travis, Pat Travis is there. Yeah. You've, you've obviously worked with Pat. I work with Pat. Yeah. You've worked, doing, you've, you work with doing, everybody though. <laughs> I did. My next book is going to be called Guitar Zeus, the book. Guitar Zeus, the book. All right. Yeah, so yeah, let's, yeah. let's talk about cool. Cactus. 1970. You guys, uh, it was yourself and your Vanilla Fudge uh, bandmate, Tim Bogert, on bass. Jim McCarty on guitar from Detroit Wheels. Uh, Rusty Day from the Amboy Dukes on vocals and harmonica. And this was, Cactus was a band that you and Tim had been, you had you and Tim had been planning something to do with Jeff Beck for a while, I guess. And then Jeff got into a, an automobile accident and you needed that next thing. And and what what did you have in mind for what the project was going to be with, with Jeff? Was it? what you eventually did it's with that be, and my piece yeah it's gonna be like cactus bba same kind mm -hmm. of thing yeah. except we were gonna have written initially rod stewart said he would sing but then something happened between rod and jeff and he didn't want to do it so you know we just said well all right let's figure it out when we let's get together and put all this, the the business stuff together he was coming over with his manager and we were going to put all this stuff together and then he got in a car wreck a few days before, and that was 18 months he was going to be out. Wow. And me and Tim said, man, we just broke up Vanilla Fudge. That <laughs> we had gigs, you know, 15, 20 grand a night that we blew out. We blew out a tour of Japan to get this started. So what do we do now? Can't go back to the guys in the Fudge and go, oh, well, look, Jeff had an accident. You want to get back together? <laughs> Mark Stein was already planning a group called the um, uh, – boomerang he was doing <laughs> so we said well let's see who else who else do we like you know we really did like mccarty mm -hmm. you know we loved him with mitch Ryder and detroit wheels and we love what he did with buddy miles you know, as he played with buddy miles so there was a group called steel that my manager managed in steel was a guy named Dwayne hitchings who has been my lifelong friend and co-writer of do you think i'm sexy and and uh, for um, Young Turks and, you know, I got him involved with Rod and blah, blah, blah. So he was playing with this group Steel. And I knew that he played with Buddy Miles Express that McCarty was in. So he said, I know how to get a hold of McCarty. And we called McCarty, we flew him out to New York. And we had the whole organization. We had the lawyer, the manager, we mm -hmm. had the road crew, we had the rehearsal place, we had you know, the whole thing set up. So all we had to do is fly people out, try them out. They didn't work. See ya. You know, <laughs> McCarty was great. And once we got McCarty, then McCarty said, I said, what about, what about a singer? He said, well, we could use, how about Rusty Day from the Amboy Dukes? I don't think he's doing anything right now. Fine, let's check him out. Flew him out. <laughs> and we started playing jamming. And what I thought was really great. He had a great, you know, really hard rock, bluesy voice. What was great about him, whenever we started playing grooves, he started singing lyrics and melodies. It was awesome. So the songs were being written like that. But sometimes he did old blues songs. I wasn't really an old blues guy mm -hmm. as far as listening to that stuff. But McCarty and him, Tim, were more into the blues than I was. I was more into jazz and progressive rock, kind of progressive jazzy stuff. Mm -hmm. And... So when we started playing what came to be Parchment Farm, I thought it was an original song. I didn't know it was a classic. Because really, we could have sung anything to that track. Because it was the track that sold the song. It was such high energy. And it's so fast on our album. It's even faster on this new album. You know? 
It's yeah. ridiculously fast. It's like I'm on speed or something. I wasn't. <laughs> I was just on energy. How long uh, did you guys rehearse before that first show? Well, we were recording the first album, so mm -hmm. all those songs pretty much were uh, recorded. But we weren't like a, you know, like a gun ho rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Mm -hmm. You know, we just got the skeletons in the song, and everything we played every night was different. It wasn't like this. I never played the same drum groove, same fills in the same spot. McCarty never played the same leads. The only thing that was consistent was maybe the lead vocal and the harmonica parts. But everything yeah. else, the, the trio was crazy. It was mad. So if somebody recorded like all of your shows, they would have every single all different. version would be different. Yeah, I mean, you could listen to Parchment Farm on the Maori Soul album. Listen to Parchment Farm on on, on our, the album that... Uh, Rhino released of the two double CDs live, it'll be different. And I release it on this one. We we have a a tape a video that we're they're putting it together of uh, Isle of Wight, which we did again another forty five minute set, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it'll be different as well. And look so, at the song that's labeled one way or another. There mm -hmm. wasn't even a song yet. <laughs> it was a great riff, and we jammed on it. Yeah, that one sounds like um, you're trying to demolish your drum set, but that's that's also how the bass and, and the guitar sound. This was uh, what we were. We were demolition crew. We should yeah. have been called demolition. <laughs> so the 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 show was May sixteenth, nineteen seventy, at Temple Stadium in Philadelphia. This is um, uh, Jimi Hendrix was there, uh, the Grateful Dead, Steve Miller Band. What do you remember from that day? Well, I remember just hanging out a bit with Hendrix. You got to remember, Jimi Hendrix wasn't the icon he is now. Mm -hmm. Grateful Dead were not what they are now. Steve Miller Band was not what he is now, you know? We were all bands coming up. We were all bands in our, like, you know, second or third year of, of, of being rock stars. Not 40 years, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was all different, you know. Everybody was hanging out back on stage. People used to come in and out. They used to have, you know. Uh, and, and the other thing is that Temple Stadium, when you think of stadium, you think of like Dodger Stadium or mm -hmm. Shea Stadium, 65,000 people sold out. Wrong. <laughs> this was a small stadium. And it most likely, from what I remember of those days, we didn't play to the whole stadium. We played to a corner of the stadium. Mm -hmm. You know, this one might have been, I don't know, 20,000 seat stadium, maybe. Maybe we played to half of it. You know? Yeah. When did you guys go on? Because I know you guys did about, well, at least for this album. We were about, first. You were first up? I think we were first. I think. I don't remember exactly. <laughs> you know? Uh, is the entire set on the album, or was there more that, that didn't that make was the it. That was it. Okay. I mean, I don't remember the full set. I don't even remember the set list. But, you know, being that you're opening the show and you're, you know, brand new, the album wasn't even out yet, I figured it was probably a 40-minute show, and that's about what that, that thing is. Yeah. And otherwise, the guy who recorded it, why would he not put the rest of it on there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. Sometimes the tape flip, the tape has, has to flip, and sometimes there's a there's a gap in some of those tapes. But uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, I don't know how this guy recorded it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but I think uh, Cactus fans are are probably happy that he did. I know they're I mean, eating it up. I gotta say, <laughs> I think Jimmy also they they re they released the Jimi Hendrix set from that same show, if I'm not mistaken. They did. Yeah, I wow. think so. So it sounds like it might have been raining at the gig because Rusty mentioned something about wet butts in the middle of the uh, in, the, in his stage. I, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. Rusty was great at taking whatever's going on now and making it fun. You yeah. Know? Instead of just saying, "Hey, it's raining," he has to say that. You know. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so you mentioned one way or another, uh, balls out instrumental rocker. Um, that's the first song on the album. And then Sweet 16, another yeah, that song. Was a, that was a jam. Yeah. One way or another was a jam. It had that riff. 
and we just jammed. Yeah, it's it's really great, actually. It's I think it might be my favorite uh, track on the album. No kidding! Wow, we yeah. would never if we played that again, it wouldn't be the same. Yeah, <laughs> that's maybe that's what's so great about it is so spontaneous. Yeah, all spontaneous. Uh, Sweet sixteen, uh, no need to worry. Very Led Zeppelin sounding heavy blues rock track. Mm -hmm. um, it, then you had a medley of Let Me Swim, Big Mama Boogie, and Oleo. Uh, first and third parts of that were from the debut album. There's a really yeah. great groove near the end where um, it's more or less just a duet between you and, and Tim. Was that a regular part of the Cactus set with you guys, you guys just getting into that That was that Tim groove? Solo. That was Tim Solo in Oleo. He yeah. always did a solo in Oleo. And nobody did a solo like Tim. Yeah. A bass solo anyway, you know, it was totally unique. We've that been doing cool. that since Vanilla Fudge. Yeah, very cool. Feel So Good was that on after that. That's, uh, that's a drum kind of, solo. It's a bit Hendrixy at the beginning. You get a drum solo spotlight in that one, yeah. like you mentioned. Um, every drummer has their own sort of approach to drum solos. What is your approach to them? Well, I like to keep it melodic. I like to build it. I like to go high, come back down. And then maybe bring the audience in, get them clapping or involved, and then climax it and go out. Yeah. And then we uh, we finish with Parchman Farm from the debut album. Um, any favorites on that uh, from from that set? Any any? I, I have to listen to it more. I tell you the truth, I only heard it maybe once. Yeah. And I'm waiting for the CD to be sent to me. You know, yeah. I got some digital version, but I keep losing it on the computer. <laughs> You know, yeah. I, I I got it and I, I didn't put it into iTunes. So, you know, when that happens, it like, where did it go? You know? <laughs> so I, I know Cactus released Tightrope, the seventh Cactus album yeah. in 2021. You guys had to postpone some of your dates. What's the status of a possible Cactus tour? Well, we got some dates back and we're going to be doing dates with uh, Cactus and Pat Travis together. Okay. Okay. So that's going to happen. Uh, we got three or four in March and four in April and four in June. And, and then we'll just see what happens. You know, we, it's, mm -hmm. we, we're, look, we're actually looking for a new agent, you know, and Jimmy Coons doesn't want to tour anymore. So when we're, we're getting a, a new young guy to play slight guitar and harmonica mm -hmm. and uh, Randy Pratt's still going to be with us, but uh, he's, he's going to be out on these, on the, uh on the march days but but he'll he'll be in for june you know because he's had some medical things going on yeah. uh you guys the new singer sounds awesome he's an english guy he's only 36 years old so that he's going to have the energy and i'm sure he'll bring the new energy to the band and you know and i was at a point myself going well, do i need to, should i even bother doing cactus anymore and then i had dinner with uh, roger earl from fog hat I said, look, dude, you created this band. It's a legacy band. You're the only one in it. Keep doing it. It's your music. It's your band. Yeah. Look at me. He's the <laughs> only one from Foghat in it. There's a bunch of bunch of people like that. Yeah. So what keeps know. you going, Carmine? What keeps you wanting to do this on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, and, and, I mean, because drumming's not an easy gig. <laughs> I love playing. Yeah, I love playing in front of audiences. I mean, I don't. You know, I come in here sometimes and I just play around, but I love playing music. You know, I don't like just playing drum solos. You know, I learned enough technique in my life. I've written technique. I educated. I did clinics. I wrote books. I got some, a lot of drumming knowledge in my head that I can use, and I use it on on my recordings. Mm -hmm. You know, and then when we go live, you know, it takes. A couple of days for me to warm up and get back into like a great solo, you know. Like uh, this year, last year, I played twelve shows, all in September and October. And when we did the first three shows, it was with my brother. We do drum wars. It's uh, another thing I do. And uh, the first two solos I did in the first two nights were like like this, you know. And the last one, I finally locked into it. And even my brother came out and said. My brother come on a piece on drum, yay! You know, we had a good sized crowd. They were going, yay. And then he said, How many people do you know at 75 can play like that? 
and the whole place started cheering, you know. But, yeah. you know, it's like, I don't know. You know. I try and take care of my health and try and work out every other day. I got a treadmill in the other room and weights. And again, it's another thing. I still belong to LA Fitness. I pay them every month. <laughs> I haven't been there in two years. You know, <laughs> there's yeah. one right up the street. Now with, with the COVID and everything, forget it. Maybe yeah. when the COVID stops, I may go to the one up the street with my neighbor that goes there. Uh, but when the COVID stops, you know, they, they have a steam room. I like that stuff. And, yeah. But uh, I just walk in here, I work, walk out in there, work out in the gym, my little gym, and come in here, and play drums. And it's plenty of workout, you know. Well, you look good. I, you could probably you could probably outlast drummers half your age. Well, I don't know about that. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of these drummers today are uh, pretty amazing, you yeah. know, with their, their feet especially. Uh, they play different different styles. Mm -hmm. You know, when my generation, the drums followed the bass, and vice versa. And the new generation, the drums followed the guitar. Yeah, you know, all that brr, 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 <laughs> feet. Just very, who's, very who's catching your ear these days? What drummers are you uh, impressed by these days? I don't. I don't really go looking. You know, mm. I mean, if I go somewhere and see somebody, I say, "Oh, that guy's pretty good." Yeah, you know. But you know, there's a lot of great drummers out there now. You know? Yeah, and I like that kid. A uh, couple of guys that I, I do know, like a Max Max Weinberg's kid, Zach. Is that Zach Weinberg? <laughs> Uh, Sounds right. I'm, I'm yeah. drawing a blank. <laughs> yeah, I draw a blank too. But his his kid, he's really good. He plays with Slipknot. You know, mm -hmm. uh, he's good. Ray Lutzer with Corn is good. He's not young though. He's 50 years old. But uh, but the, the other guy is pretty young. He's like maybe 30. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's really good. But you know, it used to be I would turn the radio on and hear new things. Now you got to sit around and like go on YouTube and look up new, new videos and see what you think I got time to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not as easy nowadays. You no, gotta, I mean, it, you gotta work at it. <laughs> yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, you gotta work at it. I mean, I, I'm not that horny to find new drums or drummers <laughs> or music because there's so much music. Yeah. And, so, and most of the music has been done already. Most of, most of the great music has been done. I mean, there are no, there are really no icons anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw a chick today on on YouTube. I was looking for something uh, on YouTube for me and my brother. And I saw a chick. She had 8.5 million views. She's a drummer playing in her bra <laughs> with half her boobs sticking out. And that's, you know, that's that's what people are looking at. These kids are looking at. You know, people. Yeah. And th this is the new thing, you know. Like that TikTok, you know. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I, my song, my song that I wrote with Rod Stewart, "Do You Think I'm Sexy," was the number two song played on TikTok a few weeks ago. You know how many people played it? You know how many views? Two hundred and sixty-eight million. Yeah, that's incredible. That's ridiculous. <laughs> it is. Know, it's on for fifteen seconds. Yeah, yeah. You know? I don't. Um, I don't speaking of online, um, there's a lot of your work on Spotify and the streaming services, you know, your Rod Stewart work, yeah. um, you know, everything, your King Cobra. Everything, everything, everything. Everything. So for you, you know, I know that the, you know, the per stream payment from these services is next to nothing, but for you, it probably adds up to something. Nope. No, not even for you. Nope. That's surprising. I have my own label. I had Guitar Zeus and I had uh, King Cobra Live and both of it and other albums. Both of them added up to, I don't know, 500 bucks, all of it. Wow. Well, let's put it this way. This is how you do it. When, when somebody streams one of our songs, we get, as a band, 0.003. So that takes 350 streams to make one penny. You times yeah. that by 10, and what do you got? 10 cents. That's 3,500 streams. Uh, times that by 10, you got a dollar. That's 35,000 streams for one dollar. 
And then you got to split it with the band. Okay. So one dollar <laughs> gives you thirty-five thousand streams. Okay. To make ten dollars, you need three hundred fifty thousand streams. To make one hundred dollars, right? Three point five million streams to make a hundred bucks. Jeez. So think about that. Yeah, it's definitely. That's why, we, that's why we don't make any money anymore. Yeah, it's definitely not, not these, ideal. New bands. It used to be, you know, like I don't know. Give me a band that was big on their first album. You know, Bad Out of Hell, 40, 40 million albums. Mm -hmm. He probably made a hundred million dollars from that, right? If he had four that album of forty million streams, right? He would have made a couple of thousand bucks times. Yeah. 10, 20 grand. Unbelievable. Yeah, Unbelievable. So nobody, none of these new bands that come out, if there are any new bands that sell you, see them. I mean, uh, we were almost done with Vanilla Fudge on a, one, a big rapper thing, and he did, ended up doing 140 million streams. We would have made, I think it was 30 grand, something like that. Or maybe, maybe, maybe 300 grand. Mm -hmm. But that's 140 million streams. That's a lot. That's a lot of streams. You know? I know. I know. They, they, it could, it's so newsworthy when they when somebody reaches a billion streams, they put out you know press releases about it. Yeah, so what, what do they do now? It used to be you got a gold record when it reached a million dollars in sales or mm -hmm. $500,000 in sales. 500,000 units, I'm sorry. Right. And then it was a million units for double plat, uh, for a platinum. Mm -hmm. Then another million double platinum, etc. What's the scale now? I don't even know. Do nobody, they still even nobody, count nobody, them? Nobody, nobody buys <laughs> a million albums anymore or a million singles. Mm -hmm. They don't even make them anymore. I don't know. A million don't... CDs. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a good question. That, that that company that does that, the RIAA, it's called. Yep. They must be out of business. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I want, they had to change their business model, I'm sure, in some, yeah, I'm some sure. respect. I'm looking, at, I'm looking at all these albums. They're all RIAA, RIAA, you know, gold, platinum, double platinum, you know, all down the line. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they do today. I don't know. That's I'm glad I came in. I'm glad I got in when I, when I got in. Yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely changed. I want to talk a little bit about some of these uh, these other projects that you have been a part of uh, that are are in the collection that you can see part of here in the video. Um, you did the drumming on the do uh, Dogs of War for Momentary yep. Lapse of Reason with Pink That's Floyd. Right over there. Right over that, there. <laughs> that is, uh, how did you get involved with Pink Floyd? Uh, well, look, I knew them from the old days. Vanilla yeah. Fudge was touring England when they were nothing. We were nothing. You know, and we did these tours with like five different groups. And then, you know, through the years, you know, we ran into each other here and there and went to their shows and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then I just got a call from Bob Ezrin. Bob Ezrin was a producer in L.A., yeah. who I knew. And... Uh, he said, uh, Carmine, he left a message, and, you know, the message is uh, machines with the little cassette tapes. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So he left a message on it. He said, hey, Carmine, I'm producing a band that's screaming for Carmine drum fills. So I called, I said, Bob, wh who is it? He goes, Pink Floyd. And my immediate action is, where's Nick? He said, well, Nick will be there, but Nick's been racing his Ferraris, and his calluses are soft, and they want some new blood to get some new stuff, and this track is just screaming for your drum fills. I said, wow, okay. So when is it? We worked out a date. I got my roadie, so I'm talking about my roadie, get my drums down there, set my drums up. Yeah. By the time we got the drum sound, three or four hours went by, and then I started recording. I was there all day, 12, 13 hours. I kept recording it, recording it, recording it, kept filling up 24 track tapes, and then when I left, Bob said, well, look, I'll be putting it together. I'll let you know when it's together. You could hear it. Long story short, I kept calling, kept calling. I never heard it until it came out. And I was up in Canada doing a movie 
called Black Roses and I, I heard it came out. I went downstairs and in Canada, underneath the ground, they have these underground malls because of the snow and the cold. Mm -hmm. And I went into a record store and I bought a cassette and listened to it on my Walkman, you know? And when I listened to it, I was blown away. I said, wow, kick ass. And I'm thinking, yeah. I mean, the thing went five times platinum, you know? Yeah. I only got the gold and the platinum here. I can call up our, my, my, I know a company that makes the gold and platinum records, you know, that I could have got a big five times platinum thing. I got nowhere to put it. <laughs> You're out of room. Yeah, my wife won't let me put it all through the house. In New York, <laughs> we have the office. I got a, I got a five times platinum uh, Rod Stewart one, a vanilla fudge and a BBA one there. You know, and the rest mm. I got here and I got no more wall space here. So if I got it, it'd just be a waste of, waste of, I'd be sitting in a closet. Yeah. Now they've just re-released that. They just remixed it and put it out again. They did? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. They just put out a new, new mix of, uh, of that album. So. Uh, the whole album. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know how they did that? Every time you mix an album, you do a few different mixes. Yeah. Yeah. So they probably just said, let's, re let's do that mix. This mix. They, they put it all together and remastered it. Yeah, new alternate mix just came out, uh, and it sounds yeah. great. I actually I bought it; it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't. I, I would. I haven't a beat it, so I don't know what. You know, your, what would you buy it on uh, CD? CD, yeah, hmm. yeah. I probably will get the vinyl. Like, some... A and M, A and M Records. Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head. I don't remember. I have to look it up. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it sounds good. I wanted to also talk to you about, you did a, a, I don't know you call it a group or a project or whatever, but you and Rick Derringer got together in the 80s and made something called yeah, DNA. 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 Yeah, DNA. And that was fun. Yeah, it, the, the album is, uh, I think it's, Party Test is the name of the album. You guys did yeah. a video for Doctors of the Universe, which I yeah. absolutely love that track. Yeah, um, me too. What What was that project like for you, and why did we only get one? Well, <laughs> it's, it started by uh, me releasing my solo album on Pasha Records. Okay. And it was Pasha Studios. I recorded a Ted Nugent album, the Nugent record, at Pasha Studios because I, they were releasing my album and mm -hmm. I was trying to help them out being you know, a big artist in there. And that was before that Quiet Riot hit. So once I recorded that album, I didn't like the drum sound. So I went in, I told Spencer, the producer and owner, I said, mm -hmm. the drum sound in the, in the room sucks. We got to fix it. I just finished working with Rod Stewart and Andy Johns and getting great drum sounds at Cherokee and Record Plant. And, he, and so how do you do it? I said, first of all, you got to get rid of all the rugs and all the soundproofing and get rid of that drum booth. You don't need that. And you set up right in the middle of the floor and, and we brought in plywood and I worked with his engineer, Dwayne Barron. And we, and we developed, we developed this drum sound that was really good. And we, we used that drum sound on the DNA record. That was a pretty mm -hmm. good drum sound, right? Yeah. Really ballsy drum sound. And then they used the same drum sound on the Quiet Riot record. Yeah. It sold five million records. <laughs> yeah. So if he was a nice guy, would have given me a Quiet Riot record for developing the drum sound that made that record happen. You yeah. Because if that drum sound was a shitty drum sound they used to have, it never would have happened. But because <laughs> it had that kick ass ambient Andy John's Carmine drum sound, it really made the album sound great, you know? Yeah. You know, Frankie Benelli used to see me. I said, the first time I saw him, I knew him. You know, I said, dude, you just sold five million records with my drum sound I created here. Because I know, thank you. And he kissed me on the cheek. You know, <laughs> he was always a nice guy. But, yeah. So that's what started it. And, and at that same time, my album was coming out in Japan and I put a tour together with me, Rick Derringer, Tom Peterson, Eric Carmen. It was called the Carmine of Peace Super Session Volume One, because I was a pretty big name in Japan at that time. And we played the Budokan, we played a bunch of things. So right after that, we did a tour in America. And then right after that, 
you know, Spencer had Pasha records. He said, why don't we do a record with you and Rick? You know, and we said, okay, well, let's do a different kind of record. Let me make it half instrumental and half vocal. And don't make it like individual vocals, make it like group vocals. If you notice all the songs were like Dr. the Universe. Mm -hmm. We had a vision, we had a, it was sold with two voices and the chorus was always gang vocals. Yeah. What about, what about you? What about me? What about us? Gang vocals. But the most, the song that I loved on there was the song that wrote itself. Yeah, it's a great title too. <laughs> because we said, well, what can we do with this song? And I said, why don't we write a song about writing a song? And what it takes to write a song. Here's the intro, here's the verse, here's the chorus, here's the double chorus, here's the bridge, and just sing that stuff. So Spencer and Rick said, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. So that's what we did. <laughs> Yeah. It was just a lot of fun, you know, and then finally we got a record deal on Boardwalk Records and we got added with Doctors of the Universe, the video, those were the beginnings of videos, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was the first video I did other than Rod Stewart on my own for my own project. Yeah. And, uh, and the video was doing great on MTV and, and the airplay was getting great. We had like number one airplay in the country. But the fucking label went out of business. <laughs> oh man! And they had I love rock and roll too. They had the same label, but they, yeah. the, but I love rock and roll was already starting to happen when they went out of business. So another label picked them up. You know, yeah, but they didn't pick us up, so it just went down the shitter. Wow, that's terrible. Uh, yeah, because it was good. It's funny you bringing up uh, Spencer Proffer because I I had Chuck Wright on the show. Not too long ago, he used to, uh, he said they called him Spend Your Profits. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That came from our, from our day. Yeah. Because, because he would, when you, you know, like King Cobra, we did King Cobra with him too. And whenever we did King, and write a song, he'd always have his guy come in and write something. And then all the publishing went to Spencer, you know, and you get the writing, but his guy's in there on the writing too. So. Yeah, you know, any any money you could have been made, he he made it for you. Yeah, I guess so. So talk. Uh, let's talk about King Cobra a little bit. You guys in the in the mid '80s, you guys had a, a big you had a hit with the the Iron Eagle theme song. Yeah. How did that come about? To, to where you did you write the theme song? Did you write the song and then they used it, or did they well, ask you? My to write buddy, it? my buddy Dwayne Hitchings again. <clears throat> he wrote it with Jay Cooker, who wrote "I Love Rock and Roll." So there was a songwriting team and they had okay. that. And, and he said, hey, we got a great song that maybe we should do with King Cobra because I brought Dwayne in to help produce the second King Cobra record. Mm -hmm. Even, I mean, the first King Cobra record Spencer produced, the second one me and Dwayne produced, but Spencer was the executive producer. But Capitol Records was screaming for singles only. We want singles, which we had to change the whole concept of the band, you know? So when he came up with that, and he said, this is going to be one of the theme songs for the for this movie. Would you want to do it? We said, sure. So we did it. And then we did the video, which Capitol Records, uh, we got Lou Gossett in, which was great. Mm -hmm. And it actually did all right for us, you know. But the core King Cobra fan base didn't like it that much because it didn't rock. <laughs> it was all keyboards, you know. Yeah. What, do you mean the album, the whole album, or just that song? The whole album and that song. Yeah. Because that was the biggest song from that album. But it wasn't like Ready to Strike or Shadow Rider or, you know, the songs from the first album that kick ass, you know? Yeah, because I, I can imagine if they didn't like the Iron Eagle song, they probably didn't care much for uh, Home Street Home that much. Well, Home Street Home, now that's funny. Home Street Home was actually the first rock uh rap song before that that uh um, rum dmc and aerosmith mm -hmm. it was yeah. before that but it never hit <laughs> but it was on the album that, you know yeah i thought that was a, a cool song actually. were you experimenting with different equipment on that album because it doesn't it doesn't yeah. sound like i mean it sounds like your style but it doesn't sound like the carmine drum sound well it was half drum machine yeah I put okay. the bass drum was a drum machine. 
and the top kit was mine. Yeah, total experiment. Yeah, you know and that was because they were looking for that single thing bullshit. You know, but on one side, like a party animal and raise your hands to rock, that was mm -hmm. normal. Yeah, right. You notice that that should have been the whole album like that. You know, but but the first album didn't do what it was supposed to do because, I mean, I know why because the A and R guy used to be the radio guy, and he he is the guy that broke all the bands before King Cobra, mm -hmm. and then he signed us there, and then he went on to A and R, and they got somebody else on radio. And then anybody that was released at that time could not get anything going on. So they put him back. But by that time, we were done with, with Capitol Records. And the first band he promoted was Poison. And they fucking sucked. I mean, come on, give me a break. You know? Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned King, uh, King Cobra. You're working on a new King Cobra. They're all Cobra. my friends, Poison. But, you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> even back then, uh, you know, the drummer couldn't even play. Now he's actually playing pretty good with friends. He, he, he took lessons and practice. He's playing pretty good now. But good. back then it was horrible, man. You know? Yeah. Um, King Cobra's got a new album coming out, you said. Yep. We're working on it now. We did two uh, with Paul Shortino. Uh -huh. And the rest of the band, it was Mark, Mark Free turned into a woman, mostly Free. and didn't want to do it. So we brought Paul in. He did a great job. We toured Europe. We did live, did a live album at, at Sweden Rock Festival. Uh -huh. That came out on uh, my label, Rocker Records, and now it's on Deco. Uh, and uh, but now we're doing this new one, and, and Mick and Dave didn't want to do it. They said, it's too much work. You don't make any money. You know, so, mm -hmm. so um, I have to agree with him. You don't make any money on it no more. So, but I said, but dude, you know, don't you want to keep the legacy going? You, we created this together. You know, there's a mm -hmm. chance to create new music just to keep it going. Yeah. They said, nah. So I said, okay, fine. So I said, well, I'll get somebody else. So I got Rowan Robinson from Dio. And okay. I got Carlos Cavazzo from Quiet Riot. Okay. And those guys are awesome players. Yeah. And we're coming up with a really cool album of King Cobra that sounds like 80s metal slash 70s hard, heavy rock. So kind of like Led Zeppelin meets King Cobra. Okay. Sounds, uh, cool. sounds like Cactus meets King Cobra. Not quite Cactus. No. Not quite cactus. It's, um, you guys were the American Led Zeppelin, right? Yeah, I know, but <laughs> but but, but um, McCarthy didn't play licks like Jimmy Page. Right. Rowan is English, but he plays that English way, which is okay. a bit different than the American guitar players. That's why it's really cool. You got him playing that way, and Carlos playing like he did in Quiet Riot gelled together with the Carmine big ass drum sound I'm getting here in my studio with Paul's vocals and Johnny Rod playing kick ass bass. Yeah. It's really gonna be a great record. It could be one of the best King Cobra records actually. And we Do you have a time? Record, the last two records we did with King Cobra were really good, I thought. Yeah. Did you hear those? Yes. Yes. Yeah. They I agree really with you. Good. I think the really sound is great. They were really good Paul. And this one it's going to be as good or better. So we have somebody better mixing. This guy, Pat Regan, is mixing. Pat okay. Regan mixed all my guitars and stuff. I know you have that, right? Yeah. You're, well, not all of it. That's no. I have some of it, but not all you, of it. You got to get the box set now, bro. I, I do. I do. Man. Yeah. Yes. Records, you got four CDs, uh, three, three CDs, four LPs. You got a booklet, and you got tracks that were not re- not finished, like it's just bass drums and keyboard, uh, bass drums, guitar, so people can play along with it. They were like rough mixes that we took home after we did a track. Mm -hmm. uh, we got two of those and another one that just has a vocal, you know. We got three new tracks that has uh, Tommy Thayer from Kiss, Derek okay. Sherinian oh, from, yeah. uh, from uh, Sons of Apollo, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we have this kid from Kodiak, a young new band that, that's a Van Halen band. And he's uh, awesome. Okay. Uh, so it's 37 tracks on there. All right. 
Dude, I'm telling you, you'd love it. Too. That's so a Pat lot. Regan mixed, <laughs> Pat Regan mixed. We, he remixed the three new songs. Okay. Do you have a he time frame on the on the new on the new King Cobra? Do you I, know? When I'm that'll gonna be say out? June or July. Yeah. Because we have to get it mixed after we finish. We're almost finished. I would say another three weeks, we could be finished. But with this COVID thing, we're all in different studios. Yeah. You know, we just brought Johnny Rod into Vegas. He went into Paul's studio, got all the bass tracks in four days. And that's what it would have been like if we had everybody in one place. Yeah. But Rowan lives there, but, but Paul got him at the beginning in there. Carlos lives in L.A. I live in Florida. So we're just shipping all the files to Paul. And once we get them all together, and then he's re-singing some of them, and I'm doing percussion here. I'm actually doing some backgrounds right now on uh, – which song am I doing backgrounds on here? Let me see. Hold on. Hold on. Can you hear that? Yeah. Okay. See what I mean about the sound? It's it's got that big fat drum sound. Yeah. And Paul, and that and the tie, we got the album title. Music is a piece of art. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And that's what the lyrics, the music is a piece of art. That's that. It through in your ears and to your heart. It gives you peace of mind. It sure does. I can't, I couldn't Ooh, agree I just, more. I just got to <laughs> finish. <laughs> you worked on one song on the Paul Stanley solo album. Yeah. The, uh, Take me away. Take me away. And two other drummers played on the rest of the album. Now, was 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 that just not? Was that a time constraint I, I, thing? I or? don't remember. I don't remember exactly. I do know I came in from Asia. I flew in and went right into the studio. I might have done more than one. I don't actually remember. But you know, when you're recording albums like that, you pick the songs for songs, not mm -hmm. for who played on it. You know. Yeah. But. I did get that one, and everyone, every everywhere I go, especially right after it came out when I was doing clinics, everywhere I went, people asked me, what did I play on that, the fills at the end, you know? And I didn't remember. It took five clinics to, on the, I did a five clinic tour. On the third clinic, I went to a store and bought the freaking CD, uh, the, the cassette, and I listened to it, so I finally knew what I played. Because when I play sessions, I just play it. I don't know mm -hmm. what I play. That's why it's hard for me to do videos sometimes, because whenever I play, I just play. You know? yeah. I don't sit down, oh, this one I'm playing in the verse, and I play it like that every time. This is what I play, in, you know, like the Cactus album, you know. You know, never play it the same. So then when the video comes, I go, oh, fuck, what did I play? You know? <laughs> yeah, you have to remember what you and did. You got to remember, and while yeah. I'm playing it, I still don't remember. <laughs> you know, and then when I hear the fill go by, I'll do it the next time so the editor can put it in. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious as to, you know, when knowing that you were on Paul's album, I just was curious as to if he was going for a particular, you know, your particular sound on that song or if, or if he wanted you for the whole album and couldn't get you for the no. whole time or something. No, he, he wanted um, he wanted me on for me, for my for my sound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> like I said, I can't remember if there's one track or if there's two tracks or three tracks. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Okay. So you've you've obviously had a, a tremendous career, played with Sly Stone, Ted Nugent, Rod Stewart, Jeff Beck, Pat Travers, um, Michael Shanker, Jan Ackerman. Yeah, they all they all played with me. That's right. They all played with you. <laughs> Do you have a favorite album from your career that you that you played on that something that stands above the rest? Too many. Yeah. This instrumental album is one of them. Lately, Blue Murder, BBA. First Fudge, yeah. Travis, I mean, I, I, you know, it's like you go into Baskin Robin and go, "What's your absolute flavor that you <laughs> love?" You know, I could pick ten flavors I love. You know, yeah. For me, it's like that with all the albums I did. I could tell you ones I don't like. I didn't like <laughs> the beat goes on by Vanilla Fudge. I thought that was ridiculous that we did that, it ruined our career. You know, that's probably one of the only ones I I hated. Oh yeah, you know? yeah. You have that one too. 
I don't have that one. I don't Good. have that one. You don't need that one. <laughs> uh, in fact, I just got your self-titled album, like an original copy, the the first pressing of the vinyl I got from a friend like of mine. Rock, who, rockers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a pretty cool record. Yeah, yeah I agree with you. So, and we didn't even get into Blue Murder. I mean, come on, no. that was that was a really great band. Well, you and, know what? If you want to do more, set it up with uh, <laughs> with that. Um, who did this one? Now I've been working with Chipster for the for the uh, guitar yeah. juice and Billy uh, James. Billy, Billy, a uh, Billy. Oh yes, a uh, uh, Glass Glass Onion. And I've been yeah. working with uh, the other guy, uh, uh, John Lappin too. Do you know him too? I don't he's know another, John. He's another another Cleopatra one. Okay. So if you want to do more, set it up with Billy. Yeah. So, it, Carmine, it's been great uh, talking to you about this Cactus album, about your career. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best with this. Um, thank you so much for your time. Just remember, music is a piece of art. That's right.